Guys, before you go on to this clip, please don't forget to press the subscribe button for more content like this. We post all our clips on this channel from the podcast. I know you're going to enjoy this quite a lot. Right. Oh, no, no, for sure. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think you'll find if and ever you do get interested in, in sort of the Indian discourse around this, that a lot of it is credited to the ancients and the continuity of it. So for that matter, having rhyming vocalized formulas of mathematics yeah. right the fact that they were oral traditions and partly because there was probably not a lot of places to write or 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 to have them symbolized on a piece of paper or an object apart from your own voice they were used in they were operated in rhyme schemes so that yeah. people would remember it much more easily and um i we call this phenomena the the uh, specifically the whatsapp uncle phenomena because if you <laughs> yeah the whatsapp uncle phenomena is uh, a thing about india where you'll receive a whatsapp forward and or more specifically a fathers would receive a whatsapp forward which will credit something that has happened in the world to the ancient wisdom of india and that i think is the mimetic part of okay. something if you dig through that stuff we'll find that a lot of these things are super true that there is in fact a continuous river of wisdom that has flown through the land but a lot of it is just funny stuff uh, a lot of it is just internet scams that you know get sold to people that are much more that came to the internet later um and why i'm talking about this is because <clears throat> i'm in it for the pjs you're in for the pjs <laughs> they get sent to me on whatsapp yeah you yeah, do yeah, get yeah. them uh, it's almost it's the intellectual equivalent of dad jokes okay that's yeah, what yeah, we'll yeah. get right yeah, yeah. um so th th the reason why i'm saying this is because I have a feeling that if you go down to it, you'll find that th that India was operating on a different time scale. And the reason it was operating on a different time scale is also evidenced by the fact that the religious component of India mm. is markedly different. That if you look at Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and what is known as Hinduism, yeah. is categorically different from Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you found that to be the case? For sure. Yeah. That the, the Abrahamic faiths have a certain kind of coherence. Right. I mean, how do I say it? Um, Christianity is sort of a user-friendly version of Judaism. And then Islam got to look at both of these previous Abrahamic faiths. And it's a marvel of design. Mm. Let me just leave it at that. Mm. It's, it's one of the most amazing designed religions of all time. Why would you say that? That... You know, it's like very, very easy to get in, super hard to get out. There's an ordering of the surahs that uh, the ones that come later, I think, take precedence over the ones that come earlier. And the ones that come later seem to contradict some of the things that come early. It's very hard to unhook um, Islam in a way that it's not hard to unhook Christianity or Judaism. Hmm. Um, which is one of the reasons why Islam is so powerful. And right. then the idea behind Jainism and Hinduism and Buddhism is that, well, from the West, we don't have a good frame of reference. Mm. So if you think about, uh, oh, you know, this crazy Jain practice that if we know anything about Jainism at all, that a family becomes successful and they rid themselves of their worldly possessions and they go off and they scatter. Right. You're like, holy crap, what the heck is that? Right. You know, or um, if, you, if you're ever exposed, um, at some point, I think uh, we went to a, a, a puja uh, for a new apartment in um, Bombay and you know, feeding some people were feeding milk to a statue of Ganesh or something, mm. and I didn't know I, I didn't have a good frame of reference for mm. it because right. it, it seemed to me that it, the soul is animated very differently in Hinduism. The belief structure, also the the tolerance for contradiction. You see, the most one I could argue that the most powerful concept in Judaism. Uh, is Ehad, which is the the number one. So if you know, if you take this uh, invocation, the Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ehad, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? In some sense, it means unity of knowledge that there are no contradictions. And if I can tell a crazy story from many years ago, I was in Goa, and. 
there was a language strike and we needed to get to Punji and we went to the we went to the bus station and couldn't get any information on the bus and finally I, I go up to this guy who's very well dressed businessman I figure he'll know some English and I said where do I get the bus to Punji he says there's no bus to Punji today and I said yeah uh -huh. he says there's no bus to Punji there's a strike Bund. I said, okay, where are you going? I'm going to Punji. Well, how are you going there? <laughs> By bus. Right. And I said, there is or is not a bus. Right. Bus will came. Uh-huh. Bus will came. I, like, I, could, I couldn't make sense of any of this. Yeah. Right. Sure enough, the bus comes. It says that it's not operating. Hmm. And we all get on and we go to Punji. Hmm. Now, I have no idea what happened. I assume that the bus was operating somewhat illegally. It was breaking the strike, or I don't know. Right. But when I told the story to Americans, they're like, what did he mean? Yeah, what did he what mean? What did he mean? <laughs> when I told the story in India, they're like, oh, yes. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in a certain sense, the tolerance for contradiction hmm. is much higher in India. Hmm. That uh, there isn't this concept of the unity of knowledge. We're all pluralistic you know, the way in which we, we, we find to avoid the truth. Um, you know, for example, the, the way in which homosexuality has been tolerated in India. You mm. can't be openly homosexual. But there is a way in which you can be. Oh, that those two are roommates, just both confirmed bachelors. Right. You know, and it's like you just don't break the illusion. Right. Um, so in part, what I think is, is that the pluralism of India is different than the pluralism of the United States. And this is partially the, the rediscovery of, um, and you know, the West is having a heck of a time with this, but I think that India is in some sense rejecting the sort of post British Gandhi Nehru vision at this point. Yes. Yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. and, and saying, maybe we have our own way of doing these things and let's do this around Hindutva. And, right. And then how do we feel about that? Well, on the one hand, maybe we feel like this is terrible. This is privileging one religion. Isn't this, isn't India supposed to be a pluralistic society? And then another version of this is, come on, man, it's called Hindustan for a reason. Mm. We're not saying that nobody else belongs here. We're just saying that we have a substrate. And this mm -hmm. is the, you know, the way the U.S. has a Christian substrate. Right. Now, I'm not Christian, but I'm very happy to be living on a Christian substrate as long as that's tolerant. Mm. So I believe in part the way to think about some of what's going on in India, and I have never heard anybody say this, is that people are repudiating the idealisms of the 20th century. If you think about like Ataturk uh, and the Kamalist v vision of Turkey, uh, Erdogan is in some sense repudiating that. India is repudiating uh, the Gandhi Nehru vision uh, mm. uh, of India. All of these attempts to impose grand ideas on people seem to be falling apart. Right. Um, you know, actually, this will help me sort of illustrate. This might be interesting for you and for a lot of your listeners. We hit the nail on the head when we spoke about the sort of different cultural understandings and how that language does not translate very well. There's a man... Um, rather controversial but very intelligent by the name of Rajiv Malhotra who does work on something called intranslatables. Say more. And he says that there is specific terminology that exists in our cultural religious corpus mm -hmm. that does not translate the same way into English. Like God is not the same as Bhagwan. Yeah. And I may be butchering his examples but he has a whole list. He has a book on intranslatables and what he's trying to do is point out the differences between the cultural grammar of India and what we know as the Dharmic traditions yeah, yeah, yeah. and the Abrahamic traditions. And um, in some way, what that points to is the fact that the ontology of these two poles of the world in yeah. some way are completely different. It's an interesting point because what, India has its own Abrahamic traditions yeah. and they are somewhat different mm -hmm. in India. You mean the Islam of India is different from the Islam of the rest of the yeah, world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that is the point at I, which... I should say the Islams... Of the rest of the world. Uh, no, no, the Islams of India. Mm -hmm. 
right? Because there's different Islams within India? Yes, and also just India... It's a painful thing to say. Um, like Beirut. Beirut goes back and forth between being very cosmopolitan and then everybody retreating into their home camps. Hmm. I think that when Islam is threatened and people retreat into it, it has one sort of a profile. But on the other hand, um, people celebrating each other's holidays in India is one of the most beautiful things. We love holidays. We well, don't sure. care. As long it's, as we don't have to It's an opportunity for food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? It's an opportunity and for so food. And so who's got a holiday? Yeah, right. <laughs> Bro, if you listen to this, 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 then you'll have fun. Okay? Don't talk to yourself. Do this. एक काम करो सब्सक्राइब सब्सक्राइब ट्रस्ट मी ट्रस्ट मी